All right, Mike, uh, you can have the floor when you're ready. All right. Let me... All right, let me know if you can see my desk. Uh... I can see it. Yeah, you can see it. Okay. I'm not sure. Are you seeing my speaker notes? Or are you seeing the or are you seeing the presented version? We're seeing the presentation, but it's not in the slideshow yet. Okay. Still a few bugs in the system yep. here. One other thing, uh, during Mike's presentation, uh, we'd like to ask everyone to mute their phones and hold questions until the end. I'm trying to do this so that you get the presentation blown up you and not my speaker notes. Uh, let me just take it off. Mike, okay. if you... I think we've got it now. Okay. So ah. just hide all of your shining faces so that perfect. Can... Yeah, Mark just did that. Okay. So, uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Mike, as uh, as Mark just said, uh, and uh, a long time. Long time astronomer, but uh, I'm kind of what I would consider a jack of all trades astronomer, not uh, more so. You know, I, I do astrophotography, I do telescope, and I also uh, play around with binoculars. But I am not, I don't think, I won't call myself an expert with binoculars. So uh, that's my disclaimer. So you can't, uh, can't uh, hang me for what you hear. But um, I, you know, I got started uh, as a kid. My aunt had a was a teacher. She had a telescope, and you know, so we'd go out and you know look at the planets and the stars. So I, I got interested at it in an early age. Uh, but then, as as things happen, you know, when I went to college, you know, other interests came about, and so the interest in astronomy dropped off. But as uh, mentioned, I was in the National Guard. I had enlisted at the time, and I went. To, I was out at annual training at a place called Fort Pickett, Virginia, uh, which is, uh, had some, some of the darkest skies I think I've ever been under at the time. And uh, I was the operations officer's driver. So I'd drive him around. And, and the way that role worked, you'd drive him around, you'd, you know, kind of sit, park, he'd go out and uh, He'd, he'd look at all the training, what he needed to. So me and the sergeant who owned the, the armored personnel carrier we were driving had a lot of time to kill. So, and a lot of time as it was at night. And so uh, one night the sergeant pulls out a pair of binoculars and starts looking up at, at, the, at the night sky. And so I never even considered it at that until that time. Uh, so I uh, started looking up at, with him and, you know, he's pointing some things out and then, uh, so as soon as we came out of the field, I went to the PX and bought myself a pair of binoculars, which I still use to this day. Uh, so that's kind of how I got interested in playing around with binoculars. Uh, so today uh, we're going to talk, uh, do like a very brief history about binoculars, why binoculars, how they work, how to choose a pair, and then some tips for uh, using binoculars to stargaze and then if you're not tired of me that by that point we have a brief tour of some fall binocular sky objects uh so we'll get going here so this is a very brief history of the binocular but the binocular is kind of tied you know in, irreparably tied to the telescope because uh you know they're essentially the same thing uh the 
So gentleman by the name of Hans Lipper, she back in the 1500s, uh, he is credited with the first patent for a refractor design telescope. Uh, and they awarded him a contract to create a binocular version of that. Never really went anywhere because it was very, the materials were pretty bad. And essentially they were, you know, uh, they were opera glasses, you know, so, you know, very small, very wide field, and they were difficult to use, uh, but they were kind of the first known pair. So this guy named Galileo comes along uh, and he doesn't work with the binoculars, but he does uh, work with a, uh, you know, his design for the telescope. Uh, so Galileo built his first telescope on that design and it was essentially a, a his first one was a 10 power refractor uh, and uh, that's what he used to make his first observations of the moon. Uh, and then he eventually made a 30 power one for Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, very simple refractor design. The lenses were made of quartz, uh, quartz crystal that were ground down. So they weren't nowhere near the quality that we have today. And the objective lens was about 37 millimeters. Uh, but they did produce an erect image with a narrow field. Uh, and so he was the first one to kind of turn the scope up to the, the sun and the moon and the planets and look at some of those things. Uh, eventually, Johannes Kepler came along in the 1600s and improved on that design. And he used a convex lens at the eyepiece res rather than the concave lens that Galileo had used. And it gave us a wider field. Uh, it but it produced an inverted image, but it did allow for more, uh, much more magnification, but the weight increased dramatically as, as the length and aperture did. And you can see a picture of uh, one of those early telescopes. They had this, the, uh, let me see if I can turn my pointer on here, but they had the, this, this enormous crane that was kind of balancing the telescope. Uh, and that's how, what they, they would have they have like a team of horses to move it to turn the telescope and reorient it. It was a very complex, not uh, not exactly a grab and go design. So from there, the two pat kind of diverged a little bit. In the 1700s, uh, a number of people tried some impractical designs that that never really took off. Uh, J. P. Lemire in the 1800s uh, kind of got the first working design. Uh, but it was still bulky and complex and didn't work very well. Uh, but in mid 1800s, and Ignacio Porro invented the erecting prism. So this this prism would take the take the uh, image from the binoculars and flip it, so that instead of having an inverted image, we had a correct image. Uh, in the 1860s, they the U.S. Navy bought two pair of them, and these were enormous binoculars that they uh, mounted on some of their Ironside warships. Uh, and again, not really practical for, for personal use. Uh, kind of the first practical design came along right around the turn of the century when a group of uh, optical designers, Abbey Schott, Abbey Schott, and then uh, Carl Zeiss, who was the instrument maker, put this together. And there's a picture at the lower right corner here that was the first uh, Carl Zeiss binoculars. And if we still hear of Zeiss today, they have some of the best optical uh, equipment on the market. So uh, that was kind of the first practical design. And then uh, from there, they came up with, through the 1900s, they had Different, uh, different designs to kind of refine the eyepieces. And then finally in 1935, they started applying anti-reflective coating to the lenses, which so we finally got something that would start to be practical for astronomy, uh, be, re getting rid of some of the additional reflected light. And then that's kind of when things took off and they started doing mass production. And, and that's where we are today. Uh, so why should you use binoculars for astronomy? Uh, shouldn't you just get a telescope? So, uh, I, I, as Mark mentioned, I'm a presenter at Longway Planetarium. So I do the daily star talk there. And I, as a number of, you know, I go to a lot of outreach events. And so at those events, we all kind of get that question. Well, what's the first telescope that I should get? Should I, what, what should I get? If I want to get a what, what, 
I want that telescope like you get. How much is that? You know, and uh, you know, then you tell them, and then they have sticker shock. And uh, but uh, you know, I, a lot of times though, I will ref offer recommend a pair of binoculars rather than a telescope for the first uh, first viewing thing. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, so we'll go through some of that here. Uh, but the first benefit of binoculars is there's minimal to no setup time. I, I, will, I got home from up north last night, you know, it was 11 o'clock and the Jupiter and the moon were right close to each other. And I did not want to go out and lug out the telescope. So I just grabbed the pair of binoculars, went on the back deck and, you know, within five minutes, I'm looking at, at what I want to look at. So there, there's much less setup time and effort. Now that's less true for larger binoculars probably than it is for the smaller because the larger ones we need to mount but you know for a set of handhelds you know you can be up and out in, in two minutes uh they are much more portable than a telescope uh as just said that as well but uh you know my my uh, primary observing scope nowadays is I think it weighs in right now at about 170 pounds when I have the mountain. Uh, it's to the point where I had to put it on JMI wheelie bars to wheel it around outside. So, you know, the, it's a lot easier just to take the, take the binoculars out less. I can put them in the car a whole lot easier than that mount. Uh, binoculars are more intuitive to use. And, you know, one of the reasons for that is, you know, depending on how you have your scope set up, you know, if you have a refractor versus a reflector versus an SCT and whether you're using a diagonal or not, you can have any one of these four images. You can have the normal correct image, you can have a inverted image, you can have a reversed image, or you could have an inverted and reversed image. Uh, so this makes navigation for the you know, the brand new telescope, I mean, it takes some time to realize that you have, if I want to look up, I have to go down and, or vice versa. If I want to go left, I have to go right. Uh, so this is one of the things that is probably the main benefit for a new beginner is you can, you can, uh, what you see is what you get pretty much. There's not, you don't have to worry about a lot of those problems when you're trying to navigate. Uh, they are more efficient. The brain processes light about 1.4 times better when you use two eyes. And there was a big study done, which I can't see because I had to hide my uh, hide my presenter view so I could keep this on the screen. But uh, there was a study done at Harvard, and they they measured one eye versus two eyes, and they realized that you know that the brain because it, because you are using both eyes, it takes strain off of the one eye, and then it, pro it, it kind of fills, your brain fills in the blanks between the two. Uh, and so it, it processes that light 1.4 times better. Uh, and so you, you're, you're able to see things that are a little dimmer than when you, if you were just looking at it with one eye through the telescope. Uh, and that, you know, that doesn't make as much difference when you're looking at, uh, you know, through the scope, you know, and you've got a big objective lens, but when you have tiny objective lenses, you need kind of every advantage that you can get. Uh, the, you know, your, your binoculars have a wider field of view, makes your navigation easier. Uh, and I thought I had a separate slide for that. Huh. So you're, you know, essentially, if you, you know, if you're looking at, you know, the typical eyepiece has a, uh, like a 25 millimeter eyepiece in a, my nine and a quarter inch SCT has a field of view of about 0.5 degrees. Uh, whereas the field of view on a pair of seven by 35 binoculars is about nine degrees. So if I want to find, you know, I can look up, I can, and if I'm not quite perfect, I can still generally see what I'm looking looking for. It's still up there in the same field of view, whereas with the, you know, the telescope, you're going to have to pan around to try and find that object if you're not right on it. Uh, so that makes, again, for, for a beginning stargazer, that makes your life a little bit easier. 
Uh, they are generally less expensive than a telescope, not always. Uh, see. I'm going to flash out of here. For some reason, I lost some of my, I don't know what happened to some of my supplementary slides. So, because I, I had a chart that talked about that, but, oh, I think I moved it. Sorry. So they are generally, you can get a good pair of, you know, binoculars for about two to three hundred dollars or a good pair you know for 150 dollars and a really good pair for 300 dollars whereas you know probably the minimum entry point for a small refract reflector telescope is about 300 dollars and that's before you buy eyepieces and everything else that goes along with it so you can definitely you can definitely uh get more of a of a pair of binoculars than you could with a entry level telescope. Uh, they are great for learning with the night sky while deciding what telescope is best for you. And what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of a telescope is a fairly specific piece of equipment, right? If you know, if if you want, if your interest is planets, you know, a big, uh, you know, a big SCT gets you a lot of a lot of light and a lot of detail at that f10 focal length if you want you know go after the real faint fuzzies you know you, that 18 inch daub is probably what you want to get you know really pull in in the you know some of those fainter objects and galaxies but uh you know until you know that you know and if you want to get into astrophotography you have to have an equatorial mount you have to have a lot more uh, control you know your mount has to be able to really accurately polar or align all those things are things that the beginner is never going to think about but they just want to look at cool stuff so you know it does the binocular is a good way to learn the night sky, sky while you figure out kind of where you want to go with this this really expensive hobby that we have and figure out uh, what's what's for you before you make a big investment you know and if if all else fails and you decide astronomy is not for you, uh, binoculars can be used for sporting events and looking at wildlife and, you know, landscapes and things like that. Uh, so, you, you know, they, they do have other uses. But probably the best reason is you may already have a pair because a lot of, you know, the, it's a lot more general purpose than, than a telescope. So, and just like the, the, the telescope you use most is the best one, you know, the binoculars you have are worth you know the, a lot more than the telescope that's still on high points catalog because you haven't bought it yet so that's the beginner side but if you're an experienced stargazer like a lot of us in this room and online probably uh binoculars are still a great for that grab and go observing session you only have five minutes but there's a conjunction happening tonight you want to see it without setting up grab binoculars go out on the deck and they're, uh, they're helpful. I'll use them a lot of times when I'm trying to find the first object in the night sky, you know, kind of figure it before, because you can see, start to see stars before they actually uh, are, you know, before it gets fully dark and you can see more of them with the binoculars. So a lot of times I'll even use it when I'm trying to figure out where Polaris is right before, uh, right before dark so I can get polar aligned. Uh, they are helpful for previewing the sky you'll be searching out it's kind of is not as useful as it used to, with a go-to mount as it is with a manual mount because uh you know with the go-to you just plug it in and it goes there but if you're using a manual mount you know a wider field of view can help you know figure out where exactly you should be looking uh you know make sure you're looking in the right part of the sky uh again they're they're a lot easier to carry on a plane than a telescope uh, they're great for viewing wider field objects such as M31. Uh, the Pleiades really show up well in a, in a pair of binoculars. M11 is also really good in a pair of binoculars. Uh, and they're, they're also a great choice for comet hunting uh, because you have, you know, and not, not like Neowise, the comet Neowise, you know, you had that big tail, it was naked eye visible, but 
you know, a lot of comets have been discovered by people using binoculars, you know, before they have the tail, you know, because they can look at a wide field piece of sky and kind of scan around a lot easier. Uh, and then if you find something you think might be a comet, then you can zoom in on it with the scope and confirm it. Uh, they also give you something to stargaze with when your scope is tied up in uh, long exposure astrophotography, which, you know, when I, well, I've got found this out lately, you know, when I start setting up a six hour imaging run and, you know, then I'm stuck. I can't look at anything else. So uh, I pull out the binoculars and I can kind of look at the night sky. So can they really be used for astronomy? And, you know, based on the name of the presentation, you probably already guessed the answer is yes. Uh, but again, we talked about Galileo and his first telescope, uh, you know, which had 10x magnification, 37 millimeter objective lens, and, and the, the material is made out of quartz lenses. Uh, and you used a single eye, whereas your average 10 by 50 binoculars have the same magnification, 50 millimeter objective lens. They're also a refractor design, so they're they're a correct image because of the prisms, and they have you know they use modern coated glass. So you you know the the point being your your modern binoculars are, are at least the equivalent of Galileo's telescope, and and in many cases are optically superior. So you know he made a name for himself. So you know in the astronomy game, so you can probably uh, do the same with with uh, a pair of binoculars. Uh, so again, you know, which, which the binoculars, the telescope, which is better, uh, you know, the answer is really neither, uh, you know, it goes back to Mr. Scott on the Starship Enterprise, you know, he always said, use the right tool for the right job. Uh, and that's what, you know, telescopes and binoculars are both, they're, they're both tools. And just like you wouldn't build a cabinet with just a hammer, uh, you know, when you observe the sky, you know, it's use the right tool for the right job. If you want to look at wide field objects, you know, the binocular might be the better choice. If you want to scan up and down the Milky Way, binoculars are a good choice. If you want to look at the real faint fuzzies, you know, and look at distant galaxies, they're not a good choice. Yeah, you know, so uh, binocular, you, the one thing, you know, like when I talk to new people at the planetarium and that is trying to get them to understand binoculars, stargazing is not inferior to a telescope. It's just a different experience and you have different expectations. Uh, it's just a different tool. So let's look uh, at how they work. Uh, and I like the quote here by Stephen Tonkin, uh, who writes a, a monthly newsletter called The Binocular Sky. Uh, and uh, but he says, the primary purpose of any stargazing instrument is not to magnify, but it's to gather light. And, th and that's really it, you know, the, the more light we pull, you know, we're in the business of, of looking, you know, of collecting photons. Uh, so the more photons we can collect, the better, right? So kind of the anatomy of a pair of binoculars, uh, at, the, at the small end, we have the two eyepieces. At the big end, we have the objective lenses, which gather the light. And then uh, at the kind of in the center, we have a focus ring and then a tripod mounting point at the very front. Now, some uh, that that pair of binoculars that I bought at the PX 30 years ago didn't come with a tripod mounting point, uh, which is unfortunate because I, I had, had to do some really weird configurations to try and fit them onto a tripod. Uh, but most of the new ones do have a, have a uh, one quarter 20 screw point bolt there that you can uh, just attach them to a, a tripod. Uh, and then the other thing on your right eyepiece will generally be thump, uh, the, a ring that lets you set, focus that side separately from the left. Uh, that's what we call the diopter focuser. And that's for getting the focus right for both eyes. So you can, you know, you'll, you'll focus one eye and then you'll use the diopter to focus the other so that they'll both be in focus. So those, that's kind of the general anatomy. And this is kind of the path that the light takes, right? We have uh, the light, the light is gonna come in, uh, you know, at the top here, 
poke and they're going to pass through the objective lens. The objective lens is going to focus that light to a point inside a prism. And that's going to bend the light and kind of shift it down. And this is just because of how the, the prism bends light and passes it out the other side. Uh, and then it's going to pass it into a second prism uh, that's going to bend it again. And the whole purpose of these two is to, to flip that inverted image from the concave objective lens and put it back the right way so that you look what you see is what you get. Uh, so the prisms correct the image, and then they focus that, that beam of light into the eyepiece assembly, uh, which is a much smaller lens. So the eyepiece assembly, uh, first, the first lens in the eyepiece assembly magnifies the light from the prism, and that's this one kind of down at the, the bottom of the eyepiece. And then the second lens in the eyepiece is going to move in and out as you turn the focus ring. And so that is what's actually going to focus the light to your eyes because it's going to move that focus point in and out until you have it focused, you know, inside your pupil. Uh, and then the third lens in the eyepiece uh, just is the one that actually focuses it to the point where it enters and in, into the human eye. But the whole point of that is that it's, it's mag gathering that light, magnifying it, and then focusing it uh, so that you get a larger, uh, larger image. So there's two types of binoculars that, you know, most of us, you know, the, the, uh, the older binoculars we would usually see are Poro prism binoculars. They have that kind of, you know, it's the one on the right here, you know, you have two, two uh, tubes and then they kind of fit, go uh, more narrow at the top. Uh, the other type of prism, uh, is a roof prism binocular. So this actually just looks like two refractors sitting right next to each other. Uh, and you might think that's what you're getting, you know, is, is just a straight light path, but there are prisms inside the roof prism binoculars as well. They're just mounted to the top of the tube. Uh, and so they, they do the same thing. They focus that light uh, so that it, you know, comes out magnified. Uh, the, the roof prisms are much more compact, they're lighter, they're easier to waterproof. The bad part is uh, they are, the, the lenses have to be specially coated and the insides of the tube have to be specially coated uh, in order to prevent light scattering around the inside of the tube and off of the edges of the roof prism. So if you get a cheap pair, you'll start to see more stars than you should be seeing because that, that light is scattering all over inside the tube. Uh, and the, there is a fix for it. They can multi-coat and uh, phase coat the, the prisms and the insides of the tubes, but that adds a lot of uh, processing time and manufacturing time, which adds cost to it. So generally cost purposes wise, a good pair of Poro prism binoculars are gonna be, uh, better than the corresponding price, correspondingly priced roof prism binoculars. Uh, and I will say that's for astronomical use. For, for daytime use, you can't tell the difference because there's, there's enough light coming through that it, uh, you don't really see any difference. But for nighttime, you really notice that scattering of the light more, and that's when you start to see stars that aren't there and things like that. So uh, for astronomical use, uh, either, you know, if you're not willing to pay the premium for the, the coated roof prism binoculars, the Poro prisms are generally the way to go. So how to choose a pair of binoculars for stargazing? You know, these are all factors that, uh, that you know, vary wildly depending on cost and, and type of binocular. Uh, but the first five there that I have in green, the, the magnification, Aperture, objective lens size, field of view, weight, and price are probably the most important considerations. I've already talked a little bit about the prism type. The focuser type, meaning that some of them have a wheel as opposed to others have like a rocker, the, and the wheel is more accurate, but it's not, you know, when you start getting into the ones that I've got marked as yellow and red here, uh, you know, you're splitting hairs and you're, you know, you can spend a lot of money trying to perfect 
something that isn't that big of a problem. Uh, so, you know, if you're real for the beginner, especially for the beginner, the ones in green are probably your biggest factors to look at. Uh, so the first thing you have to do is know your numbers. Uh, the key information about every pair of binoculars is stamped on it somewhere. Uh, so this, this pair of binoculars, uh, we see it's a 10 by, 10 by 50 wide angle, 360 feet at 1,000 yards, fully coated. Uh, so the first number, the 10, tells us the magnification. So there are 10 power binoculars. The 50 tells us the size of the objective lens. That means the, the big, big lens is 50 millimeters wide in diameter. Uh, now for a daylight use and terrestrial viewing, uh, they'll generally label them, you know, how X feet at a thousand yards. And that's how, how big of a field you can see. For nighttime, we would generally use angular field of view. Uh, so you can figure that out by taking the feet at a thousand yards and dividing it by 52.5 and that'll give you degrees field of view. So these would have a corresponding like a 6.99 degree field of view. So the first number again, magnification uh, means the image is 10 times larger than what's viewed by the with the naked eye. Uh, higher magnification is going to show you more detail and darken the background sky. Uh, but the field of view is going to decrease. The, so the more magnification, the less field of view. Uh, and this, you know, you would think that, you know, to a, at least before modern times, you know, that you usually had seven power and 10 power binoculars that, you know, 20 years ago. And those, you would think there's not a lot of change in what you can see with just that three power difference, but it really makes a huge difference in, you know, some things that you couldn't see. I, I just to experiment last night, I took out a pair of seven by 35s, just trying to find a uh, little cluster in Cassiopeia called uh, uh, Andrews Rose, or, you know, and it's uh, NGC 70, 7789. Couldn't see it at all with the, the 37 by 35s, but it, when I put the 10 by 50s on it, it just showed right up. So, you know, that three degree, three X does make a big difference in how much you can see. Uh, and here's just kind of an example of changing the magnification. So, you know, a pair of 10X binoculars, you're looking at the moon at about that size. 20X is about double, you know, and you can see 94, and then, you know, we'll get up to 588, you're looking right at the craters. You know, but you, the, the, the reason I put this slide here is because this also shows the changing field of view, how much, how much more sky you have around the 10X binoculars versus at the 588 power through the telescope. You know, you, uh, so you lose all that field of view the, the, the more you blow up the image. So your second number, the objective lens and the aperture uh, indicates the diameter of the lens. The amount of light gathered increases uh, it, by the surface area of the lens. So pi r squared uh, is how we measure how much light the lens is gathering. More light gathered allows us to see fainter objects. And just with, as with telescopes, uh, everything else being equal, bigger aperture wins. Uh, so, but the trade-off here is the larger objective lens increases the weight. Uh, and so here's kind of a visual example. Uh, the, the top pair of binoculars here are eight by 21 millimeters. So they have a 21 millimeter objective lens. So surface area of 346 millimeters squared. Whereas the 20 by 80s down here at the bottom have a surface area of 5,024 millimeters squared. So that means that the the 80 millimeters gathers about 14 and a half times more light than the 21 millimeters. So that's kind of how they, when you see it in the ads and they say it gathers, you know, this much more, that's how they're coming up with those figures. Uh, field of view, again, expresses how wide the binocular view is. And we kind of talked about this already that, you know, for terrestrial use, expressed as feet per thousand yards. For astronomical, we use degrees. Uh, 
you know, this is based on, you know, the sky being 360 degrees around, 90 degrees from the horizon to the zenith. And knowing how, what your field of view is actually, you can use your binocular field of view as a yardstick or as a measuring stick. So, you know, if you know something's 21 degrees from, you know, your reference star, three fields of view over will put you on it. And that's, that's actually how I find the Andromeda galaxy from coming off of the point of Cassiopeia's W is three fields of view over and it'll put you right on it. Uh, so weight is kind of the unwritten criteria. It's generally not discussed. They don't advertise weight as a, a, a big factor, but you have to hold the binocular steady for the entire night. So keep that in mind. And, you know, a, you know, a, my 20 by 80s here probably weigh about eight pounds, I think. Whereas the, uh, whereas the, uh, The, you know, the, the seven by 35s, even though, you know, a, a little kid can hold those steady for quite a while. So uh, the heavier, uh, you know, a shake pair of binoculars where you shake and, you know, can't really hold them steady is known as a paper because it doesn't do you any good whatsoever. Uh, so anything over 10 by 50, you're going to have to mount probably on a tripod or, or some other device just so that you can keep it steady because uh, if you, if it doesn't, I was trying to look at the moon and handhold the bigger ones and they shook so much. Even, I, I mean, I know what's on the moon and where to look and it was still really impossible to, to work with. So there, you have to mount them when they get bigger. Price varies wildly, uh, based on quality and brand. Uh, you know, there, there's a point where it's good enough. You can get a serviceable pair for 50 to a hundred dollars and a really good pair, you know, around 200. Beware anything you buy on eBay. Uh, but just here's some price comparison, you know, the a pair of Celestron 10 by 50 Poros, which are a decent pair, you can get for about 35 bucks. You know, whereas if you buy the, the Steiner 10 by 50 mili military, you know, $3,000. <laughs> You know, but you can run over the Steiners with the tank and, and they'll still work. You have to buy the tank first. Uh, so what's a, what's a good rule of thumb? Uh, you know, kind of an optimum would be 10 by 50 or 7 by 50 poros will give you a 6 to 9 degree field of view, only at, at coming in at 2 to 3 pounds with multi-coated lenses. For kids... Uh, seven by 35s are, are a good choice. I was going to hold up a pair, but realized no one online could see that. So, uh, so anyway, for kids, I would recommend, you know, seven by 35 is, is a good size. They can hold that steady for quite a while. Uh, you know, but it's a personal decision. Try before you buy. If you can, it's getting harder and harder. If you have to buy everything online, but, uh, if you get it, if you're able to go to a star party where they have binoculars, try them out. That's a good way. Uh, avoid eBay unless you're prepared to fix any issues on your own. Because uh, I bought a pair of seven by 35s. Um, they were not collimated and I had to cut them open and collimate them myself, which was a lot, you know, probably more effort than, you know, the $15 binoculars were worth. So what to watch out for when shopping, if you can get a hold of the binoculars first, collimation is one thing and you, you know, close one eye, then close the other. And you can, you can kind of see here, these are out of collimation. The, the image on the left is a little bit lower than the right. So you, if you look at these at night, you'll get a double image. So you'll have, uh, for stars, you'll have two sets of the same stars for like, I, I discovered it with that pair I was talking about when I was looking at the Orion Nebula and it was really misshapen and uh, you know so that was it's not a not not a problem you want to deal with so if you see them they have that they're slightly off just get a different pair. Uh, lens coatings the green or blue go red the red lens coatings stop because uh, they're the they're Gonna, the red lenses will filter out some of that H alpha light and things that we want, we as astronomers want. Uh, so, you know, you don't want to you don't want to limit the amount of uh, 
of, of light that you're bringing in, especially in certain bands. Uh, so the red is, avoid that if you can. Uh, other dangerous signs, uh, if they're focused free binoculars, just walk away. Uh, that, that's not true. Zoom binoculars, where, which is one where you can, you know, turn a wheel and you'll go from a five power to a 20 power. You know, uh, they, they work, but the, the, you lose field of view and they're, you lose sharpness as you change. You know, they're, they're generally made to be sharp right in the middle of the range, but on either end, they're not sharp. So uh, I've never found that that's worth it. The military grade, uh, they will work just fine, but uh, you're paying a lot of extra money for, you know, making them ruggedized so that they can be run over by a Jeep, which, or a tank if you have one. Uh, and if, you know, just if you play with the focuser and you can't find a, a clear, you know, a sweet spot in the focus where it really pops in sharp, uh, just walk away and go to the next pair. So how do you keep a steady view? Because other than, you know, other than light gathering, keeping that steady view is probably the number one thing, you know, because again, if, it, if you can't hold it steady, it doesn't, isn't going to do you any good. Uh, so the only way you're going to be able to see the fine details is if you keep them steady. At a minimum, uh, you want to use the proper holding technique. Uh, if you're if at all possible, observe seated or reclining. And heavier binoculars, you're going to have to mount them some way. You know, trying to hand hold them, it just will not work. Uh, so when I say the proper hold technique, so this isn't gonna work so well for the folks online, but uh, you, know, you can see either you're gonna wrap your fingers around the, the uh, eyepieces and the next two fingers around the, the prism, in this case, Poro prism, then you're gonna try and keep your eye on what you wanna look at, and then just raise the binoculars up while you're still trying to keep that focus. Now, if you feel along kind of the side of your eye socket, there's kind of, there's like a notch, like right over here on either side. And so, you know, you're going to wanna to try and fit the two fingers that are holding the eyepieces to that notch and then keep your keep your elbows locked in a triangle and that gives you you know kind of distributes the weight and lets you hold them much more steady now if try this uh, if i open up this one and again folks online i'm just showing a different pair of binoculars you know it's a bit more of a problem when you've got these you know, that are, you know, weigh eight pounds. Uh, but the technique I would use is still the same, that that hold helps you to keep it steady. Uh, so, but if you can't, if you can observe seated or reclining if possible, and here's some interesting things I found. A lot of these came from a book called Night Watch, which is uh, a really good primer for astronomy. Uh, you know, but you have the guy, the uh, one person he's got his mounted on a monopod. So he's holding, using the monopod to keep it steady and gravity is kind of keeping it pressed to his eyes. Uh, the person in the little raft, I think that that works pretty well. I actually kind of do something like that when in the winter, I'll, if I go out in the backyard, when I got a bunch of snow, I'll kind of hollow out a spot for myself in the snow and just, uh, you know, as long as I've got the snowmobile suit, I can stay warm for a little while. My favorite, I think, is the guy here who took a pair of crutches, though, and cut them in half and used those to kind of create a mount with he just so he can, he's taking the weight on his shoulders. Uh, and that's, a, that's, that's probably the most innovative one. Uh, but if one of the problems we have with a pair of binoculars, especially, you know, if you can see the, this gentleman's got a pair of set here on a, on a, a tripod, is observing at the zenith is always a problem because you, you, know, you can't get under that tripod to look straight up. Uh, so if observing reclining like this is probably the best way you know, to get under and look up, look straight up at the zenith. Uh, 
but uh, there are a few other designs that are going to let you do the same thing. Uh, tripod, I mean, if that's what you've got, work, you know, you can work with it. It's just, you know, plan your observing session so you're not trying to look straight up. You know, just look at that target earlier in the night or later in the night when it's moved away from the zenith. Uh, but the parallelogram mount here on the left uh, is, you know, this is kind of, it mounts on a tripod. You can buy these commercially, or there's a lot of plans to be able to make one. Uh, this is one that was for sale here in our Seven Ponds auction a couple of uh, years ago. But, you know, you just move it. There's a counterweight to keep, kind of offset the, the weight of the weight of the binoculars. And so it'll keep it in the same position. These are about, if you're gonna, if you're gonna try and take binoculars to a star party where multiple people are gonna try and come and look at them. This is a good way to keep them in the same position uh, while you're talking about what they're looking at. But, uh, and then these other, you know, the one in the middle of the, you know, somebody just built a chair around their parallelogram mount. And then the one on the left is what it's called a mirror mount. Uh, so your binoculars are looking into that mirror, into a mirror here and then the mirror is looking straight up and then you, so you adjust the position of the mirror to see what you want to see. Uh, I've never used that kind, so I don't know how good they are, but did you? So yeah, I've heard they're, I've heard they work if you get a decent, a good mirror, you can't just use any mirror, I guess, but yeah, yeah I guess not. <laughs> Yeah, so the base swings and then he, he's got a hinge so he can rotate up or down from there. So, uh, you know, a lot of these things are homemade. So it depends how crafty you want to be and how much of a wood shop you have. Uh, so just a few tips and tricks to get the most out of your binocular observing. Uh, so probably an imp one of the, the most important thing is manage your expectations. Because uh, I think most of us or a lot of us have been to star parties, you know, where, you know, the expectation is, you know, you've got the, you know, here's a galaxy. I want to see this galaxy that I saw through the Hubble, you know, in this case, Messier 91. And what you're actually going to get is this, you know, where you're looking, you know, that little faint fuzzy in the middle is actually the Andromeda galaxy uh, through, you know, in local light polluted sky. So. Uh, just knowing that uh, you're not going to get that Hubble image. So with binoculars, I, in, in, except in most cases, it's, it's really all about uh, finding the object is more, is, the journey is more important than the result almost. You know, finding the object at all is sometimes, uh, you know, the goal, especially with the faint fuzzies. Uh, plan your session if possible. Uh, you know, while I, you know, one of the benefits is the, you know, the grab and go ability of a, of just being able to take the binoculars out. If you, if you want to go out and you're going to do something seriously and you're trying to look for some specific targets, uh, you definitely want to, you know, plan where that target is going to be. Again, you know, if, if you're using a tripod mounted binocular or looking straight up at the zenith, you know, you, you better waiting for a different time or coming earlier or later. Uh, use the planetarium pl program or planisphere to figure out where it's going to be. Uh, I plan, I always plan at least three sets of targets in case there's clouds in one part of the sky. That way I can always move to the other part. Uh, take into account the phases of the moon uh, and, and other light pollution because when it's a full moon like this, you'll see half of the, what you could on a clear, on a new moon. And here in, you know, in the Genesee County, Southeast Michigan area, you'll still see half probably of what you could see up in, you know, like if Bill, Bill Beer's place up in Cadillac or, you know, up, up at one of the dark sky parks because it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it, with the bigger lenses, sometimes, you, you know, on a telescope, it'll, you can overcome that a little, but with the little lenses on a pair of binoculars, it's a little hard to overcome light pollution. So you you lose more faster, I think. Uh, map out your primary targets and, you know, but also leave room for sightseeing, you know, just scan up and down the Milky Way. Uh, don't, 
get discouraged if you can't find it after a few minutes, you know, move on to the next and then come back at it. Uh, sometimes it's just, you know, you need, need to look at it again. Uh, and, you know, keep a log if, if you're so inclined. Uh, things you absolutely have to have are clear skies and a pair of binoculars. Recommended are the charts, red lens, flashlight, and pen and pencil. Everything else is optional for binoculars. No, don't need dew heaters. You don't need uh, you know, a computer or any of that. Uh, a note on the limiting magnitudes, though. You know, the, the naked eye, with a naked eye, most of us can see anywhere from you know, a, a magnitude four to a magnitude six star, uh, depending on how old we are and what the light conditions are. Uh, with a binoculars, you know, you can go anywhere from magnitude eight to ten, uh, and you know, it's again based on given our age and all that. But uh, you know, the binoculars will, will pretty much double, at least double the amount of sky that you can see in the, the number of stars. So, uh, but there are limits. You know, it, it, it's you're not going to be able to go down and look for, you know, the, the real faint, you know. ARPA galaxies or any of that with pair of binoculars. Uh, dark, uh, again, dark adaptation is, you know, dark skies versus light polluted makes a big difference. Full versus new moon makes a big difference. But don't use your phone. <laughs> it, you know, a lot of people have the, you know, love, and, and I love my, my, my phone apps too. But as soon as you look at that phone, you, you, trash your night vision uh so i i i don't you know if you if you're going to do anything you know put, get a paper chart and use it with a red lens but even try and avoid the red lens because that affects us through binoculars more than it does through the big scopes uh so just try your best to plan it out so that you don't have to look at a phone to figure out where you're going to go uh, and last, averted vision does work with binoculars, just like it was with telescopes. So once you find it, just kind of look away and, you know, the, the cones on the side of your eye will help pull in some of that light uh, that, that maybe the rods on the center aren't picking up or, or vice versa. I always, get, I always get the cones and rods mixed up. Uh, so what can you see, you know, just to sum it up here. Uh, binoculars are going to let you see, you can see at least 100 craters on the moon with a pair of 10 by 50s. Lunar eclipses, uh, moons of Jupiter are visible, at least the Galilean moons are visible through binoculars. You can see, I have seen Neptune and Uranus both with, uh, with binoculars, they only look like the little blue dot, but you know, you can, you can do it. Uh, and it's, again, it's the joy of discovery more than actually studying it in depth. Uh, you can see, again, probably four times the stars that you could with the naked eye. Double stars and variable stars are really uh, things that you can observe well with binoculars. A few bright galaxies. Uh, open clusters are probably what binoculars are really best at. You know, the Pleiades is, is, is really good through binoculars. M11 is really good through binoculars. Uh, the Beehive Cluster and the, and the Wild Duck Cluster are also really good. Uh, you can look and find globular clusters through binoculars as well, although they're going to look like just a real fuzzy little star. Uh, it's really hard to resolve some of those individual stars with, with them. Binos uh, will pull in some of the brighter nebula. I've seen uh, M42 is, is really good in binoculars. I've seen the Lagoon, the Eagle, and uh, the Omega Nebula, as well as the Heart and Soul Nebulas all through, through binoculars. Comets, uh, asteroids, and meteors. If I, I've never tried looking for asteroids, uh, but I'm told you can. Uh, solar eclipses, if you have the proper filters, uh, although I, I have not spent the time getting solar filters for my, my binoculars. Uh, some great resources that you can use. Uh, Stephen Tonkin's Binocular Sky newsletter. It's a free newsletter. All you have to just, yes, there it is. just Google it and, uh, you know, he tells you 
top objects to see each month. He sends it out on the email, an email out every, uh, it's like the first of every month. He's the only thing is he's located in Great Britain. So uh, his latitude, I think, is a little higher than ours. So, but uh, Gary Saronic for a long time wrote the uh, binocular highlight column for Sky and Telescope. And he published a book, which I'm holding up in the room, uh, you know, but it's uh, binocular highlights and it gives you like a full picture of the object and, and the star charts to where, where to look for it. And uh, it's, it's a really good, good book. Uh, also, if you're, you know, Turn Left at Orion is another really good one. Uh, turn Left at Orion, he tells you, you know, there's star charts. It also tells you what works for binoculars versus telescope and, and what, uh, which ones to look at. Uh, every month in Sky and Telescope and Astronomy Magazine, there is a column of uh, Matt Weddle and does it for Sky and Telescope and uh, Phil Harrington does it for Astronomy Mar Magazine. They're both uh, really good, you know, just here's one object you can go and find each month. And then uh, if you do get into, into it, the Ast Astronomical League has three observing programs for binoculars only. Uh, there's a Messier objects, there's a double star, and I think a variable star. Uh, so those are some, those are, uh, they get, and they give you lists and you go and just kind of track your, track your progress, finding each of them. And then eventually you get a nice colorful pin if you, if you find them all. So that is kind of the, the, the overview presentation. I don't know where, how my time is or if I, am I at Okay. You're fine. You're fine, Mike. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears. Just do a real quick tour. Of sure, how this is going to work. Uh, if because uh, some of these are some are kind of dim, so I don't know how they're going to come out up there. Uh, so I think I have to unshare and reshare the other presentation here. Uh, Mark, can you see a screen that says Paul Binocular Sky Tour? Yes, we can. Okay, so I don't have to reshare. These are just a few objects, how to find them, where to look. Uh, so once again, note on expectations. Uh, you're not going to get Hubble telescope images, but half the fun is finding them. So, you know, just, just preset your, your, your expectations. So the first object uh, is the moon, easy to find, plenty of detail. You can see craters, rays, mountains, the Apollo landing sites. You can't see anything at the Apollo landing sites, but you can see, it. no, the, uh, the only thing I've ever seen that really shows and shows the objects is the lunar reconnaissance orbiter that's in orbit around the moon. That's the only one. And now that's cool. If you ever ha if you haven't looked at it, go to NASA's website, look up LRO for lunar reconnaissance orbiter, and uh, especially I think it's the Apollo 17 where they had the the lunar rover. You can still see the tracks of the rover where it drove around, you know, and kind of the paths of the rover drove in the fire track. Uh, but you can't see that with binoculars. Uh, so this is roughly the view you would get through a pair of 20 by 80s, uh, you know, with the moon. And you can, so we can see, you know, uh, there's, there you can see all the Maria, we can see kind of the lunar mountains here, you know, the Apennines and the Caucasus Mountains and the lunar Alps as you go up around Mare Imbrium. Uh, over here, we can see Mare Serenitatis and Mare Tranquillitatis down here below. Can, I, can you see my pointer moving? Uh, and then there's a little peninsula that kind of sticks out down here in Mare, Mare Tranquillitatis. And that at the tip of that kind of looks like the Michigan Mid, a little bit the lower peninsula, right about where Traverse City would be on that peninsula right at the tip. Uh, is where the Apollo 11 landed. So you can see the landing site, kind of pick it out, but uh, that's about all you'll be able to do. Uh, if you look at the, uh, 
from the mountains here, uh, kind of where this big dark area over here is, you know, the sea of, or sorry, this is the sea of storms, Oceanus Procellarum. So if you kind of follow the man in the moon's nose here, which is the Apennine Mountains, that's going to point you out into the darker area. There's a big crater there. That's the, uh, that's the Copernicus crater right there. That's fairly easy to pick out with binoculars. Uh, and you can pick out Tycho and a few of the others down here at the South Pole, but uh, South Pole, there's individual craters with, with binoculars. So with the planets, uh, you can see the planets with, uh, with binoculars. Uh, and where to look, they'll all follow the plane of the ecliptic. So, you know, look southeast to northwest, or sorry, south, southeast to southwest, you know, in about 42 degrees due south. Uh, so with, with the planets, though, you, you can see, you'll be able to see that it's a disk, not a, not a pinpoint like a star, uh, you know, but it's, it's a little bit difficult to see any details, even on Jupiter. Uh, you know, but you can see everything will kind of be along this arc here of the ecliptic plane. Um, so this is tonight, where we see the Jupiter's fairly near to the moon, and then Saturn's about due south at about 8:30. Uh, but this this little dot here, this is Jupiter, and you can kind of just barely pick out one of the moons. I believe that's Europa. That's kind of just to the left and down beneath it. Uh, so that's about the view you'd get through a pair of 10 by 50s. Uh, so again, you're not going to see a ton of detail, but you can, if the moons are positioned right, see all four moons. Uh, if you've got a pair, you know, seven power, you'll see less of it, probably less moons. 20 power, you might even pick up one of the smaller moons. Yeah, you can see the crescent, uh, the Venus in phase. That's uh, that is possible. So this is Saturn, uh, and you can barely see. It's a little hard to pick out on the screen, but you can see that it's it's oblong. It's not perfectly round. You can see the distortion from the rings. But this is, again is about the view that you've got of Saturn through a pair of binoculars. Uh, Mars, I have picked out, it's like a little red spot, but it's not up this time, you know, it's in the morning and I don't get up early, so I didn't get a picture of it. In the Venus uh, you can see double stars, so here's Albareo. Uh, you know, stars, they appear to the naked eye, they're going to appear one, but, uh, you know, if you have a, a pair of binoculars, you can see the split. Uh, this is at it's uh, at the front tip of Cygnus the Swan, it's about 380 light years from Earth. So where to look for it, if you find the Summer Triangle, which is still visible. Uh, if you find the uh, Eastern Star, which is gonna be Denna, Eastern Star at the back of the triangle. Denna, that's the tail of Cygnus the Swan. binoculars close you'll be able to find it and get in the right ball. this is probably a, an easier one to find uh aldebaran which is an orange giant it's about 44 times the size of our sun two and a half solar masses this is also a double star uh, I have not been able to split it myself with binoculars, but I have old eyes, so someone who's younger than me might be able to, or with a bigger binocular. Uh, but this is the eye of Taurus the bull. So if you look and find Taurus the bull, find its snout here, and then look right up there, this bright orange star here would be Aldebaran. Uh, when I give this talk in the winter, I always talk about Betelgeuse, not Aldebaran, but uh, Aldebaran is fairly bright, so it's a pretty easy one to pick out. Uh, but Aldebaran will 
also get you in the vicinity for the Hyades cluster, which uh, it comes out really nicely in a pair of binoculars. So this is an open cluster. It's one of the nearest clusters to Earth. Uh, and it is the snout, so that V shape at the front of Taurus the bull. Uh, and it, if it's on a line between Orion's belt and the Pleiades. So if you kind of find Orion's belt, here Orion is still rising here, but go straight up, it's going to point you towards the Pleiades at the end, but the Hyades is kind of here in the middle. And it's this triangular shape at the base of Aldebaran's snout. Or, so, Taurus is now. So this is kind of, you can kind of see it here. It's, the picture really doesn't do justice to what you see. It's this triangular shape. This is Aldebaran here. And you've got a lot of little doubles here. And you can see a lot more stars in the cluster with binoculars than you can with, uh, if you're using just the naked eye. Oh, yeah. At least no sits. All right, so our next target would be a globular cluster. Uh, so, so the globs are little, gonna look like little will-o'-wisps. They're, I, I think they're what they, one theory is that they're failed galaxies. They, they were like little dwarf galaxies that never quite made it when the universe was forming. Uh, so they, they orbit above and below the plane of the galaxy, above and below the core. Uh, and these are some of the oldest stars in our galaxy. Uh, so the one that I'm going to point out is Messier 15, uh, which has about 360,000 stars in it. And it's easy to pick out or easy to find the location because it's really close to the Pegasus constellation. So if we find Pegasus, Mark, that, that volume is cutting in and out. Be better now? Uh, yeah. That's right, now we can hear you, yes. Yep. All right, let me move the mic close. So the, the star here, Enif, at the end of, the, uh, of Pegasus's nose, put, your, put the left edge of your binoculars here, and then you should have the Pegasus cluster inside the field of view. Uh, and it's going to look, you're, you're not going to have a lot of resolving power for globs because they are very far away and f they have a fairly low surface brightness. Uh, but you can see it's going to look like this fuzzy ball of kind of instead of a, a fixed point like, a, like the other stars. So that's about what you'd see a glob as. Uh, the Andromeda galaxy, uh, again, this is fairly easy to pick out. It's the nearest galaxy to the Milky Way. Uh, it's about one and a half million light years away from the Earth. And uh, estimate, I think, was about 1.23 trillion stars. And eventually it's going to collide with the Milky Way. So if you wait around like six billion years, we're going to, or, or two and a half billion, something like that. I won't be around for it. Uh, but it's going to look even through a telescope, this usual, you know, uh, you know, my, my telescope only really shows this as like a little, I see the core primarily that I, I looked through, they had Dobzilla, that big one, the Warren club had up at Bill beers place when I was up there. And, uh, through that, you could see, uh, start to see some of the, the spiral arms a little bit, you know, that was like a 20 inch Dob. So. Yeah, and, uh, and again, it, it, it up north versus, or you know, dark skies versus Genesee County makes a big difference. So, uh, but how to find it? Uh, so, for to find Andromeda, I usually use, you know, start find Polaris to have my common starting point. Then find Cassiopeia. Cassie's kind of high up in the sky right now. Uh, and, you know, one side of Cassiopeia's W is a lot more pointy than the other. Uh, so if we use the pointy side, it kind of makes an arrowhead shape. Draw a line from Polaris to the point Shadar here at the point of that arrow. 
and that gives you your arrow pointing us in this direction. It's about 22 degrees, 21, 22 degrees from Shadar to the Andromeda galaxy. So three fields of view of a pair of 10 by 50s, just move it one, you know, kind of side by side by side. And, uh, you know, it will have you pointing right here at, at Andromeda. And again, you just look for that kind of faint fuzzy, fuzziness at the core. Uh, the double cluster in Perseus is probably one of the, is another one of the better binocular objects. Uh, you know, and the reason I say it is like in my nine and a quarter inch scope, I can't always get both clusters inside the eyepiece unless I re use a really, you know, like a 40 millimeter, 50 millimeter eyepiece. Uh, whereas in a pair of binoculars, I can see them both very well. Uh, so these are two distinct, if, if anyone hasn't seen them, they're two distinct clusters. They're about both about 7,000 light years away and about between four and five and a half million years old. Uh, these are naked eye visible if you're up in like a Bortle one sky, but my eyes aren't that good anymore. So, <laughs> uh, so the way to find them, uh, again, we use Cassiopeia. This time we use the open side of the W, draw a line from Navi, the central star to, you know, its next star and just kind of follow that line down. Uh, and it's about seven degrees or so. So just, uh, you know, one field of view, maybe one and a half, depending on the binoculars you have, will put you on the double cluster. Uh, and so here's kind of what you would get is up here in the right corner. That's the double right there. And it's, uh, you know, they're faint. And depending on the skies you're in, you'll see more or less of them. Now, if you are in uh, really dark skies up in, you know, Cadillac or, or up in one of the dark sky parks, you might notice there's some hazy stuff over here in the same field of view. This is the heart and soul nebulas, uh, which are going to, you know, just kind of hard to pick out. Uh, I've never been able to see these inside Genesee County uh, where I live, but up north, uh, you can actually get those in the same field of view. They're going to look like, they probably look a little fainter than they do in the picture, but uh, I have been able to pick those out with, with a pair of binos. Uh, the ring, now this is a, the ring nebula is a little planetary nebula in Lyra the Lyre. Uh, so this is essentially what you, what it would look like, uh, at this, that's about the size that it would be. Uh, and it's just going to look like a little kind of gray spot. Uh, this is, this, I would say is very difficult. Uh, according to the astronomical league, it is possible to see it through, uh, through larger binoculars, through 20 by 80. This would be the view through a pair of like 20 by 80s or 25 by 100s. Uh, not something you're going to see with, with the smaller binoculars. But this is the remains of a star, you know, roughly the size of our sun. Uh, and you need really dark skies to pick it out. But if you were to look for it, again, look for the summer triangle, before we looked at Deneb here at Cygnus, this time we're going to look at Vega up here at the other point of the triangle in, in uh, Lyra the Lyre. Lyra kind of looks like a fish-shaped constellation or a necktie almost. So if, I, I always picture it as a fish rather than a lyre. You look, go down to the head of the fish and about halfway between the two stars that make up its face, that's where you'll find the ring nebula. And I believe, oh, so then the last one, the Pleiades cluster, and that is not a picture through binoculars. Uh, but this is west of Taurus on the line from Orion's belt. And this is probably the best cluster to look at, I think, through, through binoculars. Uh, I can spot this in Genesee County naked eye. So this, this one is, uh, if you're in, you know, Southern Michigan, I think you can, you can make out the cluster if you're, uh, you know, if you're up north or in a border one, two, three sky, you can start to make out some of the nebulosity with binoculars. 
uh, but where you're going to look again start if you find orion's belt go up through aldebaran through the, the hyades it'll be kind of on that same line if you just follow the line from the three belt stars uh, and that'll the the pleiades is right there and this is kind of more of a view that you would get through binoculars please ast astrophotographers please don't fault my star trails on this one because <laughs> this was shot uh, just off a tripod. Uh, so those are kind of the main ones that I would look for this time, you know, this September, October time frame. Uh, just a few others were a little early for Orion. He's still pretty low, but if you stay up till like four in the morning, you might start seeing, might start getting high enough. But uh, so this is the view of Orion that I shot through the eyepiece of a pair of seven by 35s. And so this is kind of the, the what the kids binoculars would show. Uh, you'll get a little more through the 10 by 50s, but so even there, you, you I mean, it really stands out just because, you know, the trapezium cluster at the heart of Orion really kind of makes that nebulous gas glow. And so it really stands out pretty well. Uh, and the, the bigger the binocular, the more you can see. Uh, also honorable mention here in the Orion's belt region, uh, there's a kind of a serpentine cluster of stars that wraps around between, uh, all, uh, this is all attack on and Mintaka. So between the, on Orion's left, our right, uh, you know, I think this is colander 70 is the name of this cluster, but it's like an, almost like a snake that kind of wraps around the belt stars. Uh, and these are, these are a good one. Just kind of start over here at Mintaka and just kind of scan around with your binoculars and you'll be able to, uh, it's a really pretty cluster in a little pretty area of the sky. I don't think you can see the horse head over here with, uh, you know, that the, that's where the camera, uh, sees more than the human eye. Uh, comets you can pick up. This is one I, sh this is Neo eyes that I sh shot through the eyepiece of the 20 by 80s. Uh, Milky Way though, uh, you know, probably if you don't have a specific destination in mind, start with the Milky Way. This is up at Bill Beer's place. Uh, but you can, if you kind of look between Sagittarius and Scorpius, that'll give you the galactic core. And then you can scan up and down, you know, if you think about it, this is the arm of our galaxy. And so that's made up mostly of little star clusters. So if you just scan up and down, you'll be able to, to see it. And you can also find the lagoon and the eagle and uh, the, uh, the Omega Nebula right in here. And I've, I've been able to see all, all three of those through binos. Uh, they are, they'll appear gray. There won't be any color to them because our eyes just don't see color with that without a lot more light, but uh, you know, that's a good way if you, if you don't have any other destination, just en enjoy the ride and follow the Milky Way up over the sky. And don't forget about the other side of the Milky Way, the Cassiopeia region. Uh, this, is, this is the Cassiopeia region. Uh, but, and you can, you know, it's same. It's, these are very, this is the densest. These are some of the denser parts of the sky. So just follow it along and you'll, You'll find a lot of objects. Here's the Andromeda galaxy right here. Uh, and I think, where's the double? I think this is the double right in here. Uh, but, you know, again, just scanning up and down this, you'll see a lot of clusters, a lot of nebulosity. Up around Cygnus region, you'll find the North American nebula. Uh, so all things that you can find. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you for listening and putting up with me for an hour or so, and I hope uh, hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, that was great, Mike. Um, thanks again for your great presentation, and uh, let's open it up to questions. You can unmute yourself if you like and ask a question, or you could uh, ask it through the chat. No questions? Can you hear us, Mike?
Mike, can you hear us? Can anybody hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. I think we lost them. Let me check real quick. Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear us, Mike? Yeah, I can hear you. All right, uh, we were just going to open it up for questions. Um, if you couldn't hear me before, you can uh, ask a question in the chat if you're on Zoom, or you can unmute yourself on Zoom and ask, or you can ask in the room. Okay. Bob had a question in the room. Yeah, so Bob, Bob's question was, uh, have I ever used the image stabilized binoculars that like Canon and some others had produced? Uh, I have not. Uh, I, I've, I've seen a demo pair was about it. I've, I've heard they work really great, but I've, they're, they're probably what, 10 times the price of a, a regular pair. So, so I have not. Yes, sir. Yes. It's a so the question was, uh, have I tried the cons, you know, the, the extra wide pair of, uh, you know, the, I think the ad in sky and telescope is dope your eyes. Or I think that's what's uh, yeah. So it's like a two power. So yes, yeah. I have, uh, somebody had them at a star party. I was at over the summer and they were really, it, you know, you can't see a lot of, de you're not going to see any detail, but in terms of stars, it like triples the number of stars that you could see with the naked eye. So, uh, and, and I, the, what was it? The, the lagoon nebula was up at the time. So I was able, I was able to kind of see the, where the lagoon was and the, you know, but no detail whatsoever. And, you know, so it, it shows you more, but, uh, to me, that, that's kind of a niche piece of, kit so I, I haven't i haven't spent the money any other questions anywhere so paul just said that if we had previous presentations that someone had done about those 2x binoculars so if anyone's interested you can look back in our past presentations uh, yes you can you can find that on youtube that was uh dr dale parton who did that for us okay any other questions in the room oh any questions online i guess before uh let's ask john luke who just rejoined us uh, do you have any questions john luke uh no not really but it was a great, great presentation sorry to leave because like i was um i i i had a ton of where i had no signal so like I, I i just came back i just arrived at penn station so sorry if i sorry if i, if I missed anything yeah oh no problem we're recording this um if you want to find us on youtube we should have it up sometime tomorrow oh sweet thank you so much yep thank you i don't have a question but i have something to say um I got a nice pair of Nikon binoculars. I used them once at Bill, Bill Beers. I took them to the Stargaze and I never saw them again. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. I lost them. I know I couldn't, <laughs> uh, I didn't realize it till I got home, but you know, I have so much stuff piled in my car. And I remember setting them up inside in the back seat area. And I think they must've fell out at some point when I opened the door, I stopped. Well, whoever there. found them got lucky. Yeah, unless I got ran over. I I stopped at that gas station going home. Uh, that's just before you get on M10. And they have a big dirt area. So I pulled off there to get my boots out, uh, to take my boots off and put my shoes on to drive home. And I think they must have fell out there. That hurts. And it hurts a lot. <laughs> I used them once up at bills and i thought man this is great you know it was over the summer i looked exactly what you're saying in the in sagittarius i could see the nebula great it was beautiful and then that's the only time i got to look <laughs> that's disappointing but 
it's just a story. And Bob, I think you had one more question. So we'll, or you can have five more. I don't care. Yeah, I'm, here on the, I'm here all night. <laughs> Try the tip, veal. Tip your waiters. <laughs> Bob asking his question. Mike, did we lose you again? No. Oh, okay. Bob's explaining his question. Sorry, I'll repeat right. it here. Okay, sorry. So I, I believe, uh, you know, what, so Bob said, you know, we talked about looking at different objects and uh, how, you know, it's unfiltered it's an unfiltered view and he was asking if I knew of any binoculars that you could apply a filter to as a, you know, put a, like a, either like a sky glow filter or something like that, or a neutral density filter to enhance the view of certain objects. And, uh, your cheaper binoculars, no. I believe there's some Zeiss, bino Zeiss, Zeiss, Zeiss binoculars uh, that have eyepieces where you can actually fit a filter into them. These are probably in the two to three thousand dollar range, though. Uh, the other thing I do have, though, is yeah. The other thing I do have is a I have a set of bino viewers for my scope. Uh, and there I can put, uh, you know, I can put a, a one and a quarter inch filter on the end of it. And, and so that works, but then you, you don't get the wide view there. And... Right. So. That's what I have. So anyone else? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, so the comment in the room was uh, Thousand Oaks makes a set of solar filters that you can put on uh, on a pair of pair of binoculars. Uh, Celestron also has a, a pair that come with an optional set of filters. Uh, yeah, I, I I agree. They do have. Them. I just uh, for me personally, I. I have a, I usually, I have scope filters for my scopes. So that's usually what I will look at the sun through <laughs> just because I, it's one more piece of kit. I, I'm going to leave on the tailgate like Mark did and lose. <laughs> Sorry, Mark. Yeah. I don't recommend it. Are there any other questions in the room, Mike? Yeah. So, uh, uh, Perry's talking. Is it Perry? Perry's talking about uh, how the the uh, binos are nitrogen purged, so you don't get dew inside. Uh, yeah, you still get it on the outside if if you're out all night. But yeah, yeah, they the nitrogen purge does keep the you know at least the tubes from fogging, so which is a good thing. So. All right. I think who do I Mark, do you want are you taking over or Bob or uh we don't have anything else to share. Um so this will be the end of our meeting. But thank you very much again, Mike, and thanks everyone for coming. Um you don't have to leave if you want to stick around and chat, then you're more than welcome to do that. Thanks, Mike. That was really great. Yeah, thanks, Mike. That was yeah, a good very job, good presentation. Mike. Excellent. Thanks. All right. Thanks. I appreciate it, everyone.